Thank you very much. I'm really sorry I can't uh, speak French, uh, so I have to use this kind of imperial language to communicate with you. Okay, what I'm going to present you is a uh, um, personal vision about uh, how we can understand today the aroma of wine. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, particularly I am not going to talk many about molecules, of course, I will t mention some molecules, but what we are really interested in is understanding how the different molecules, aroma molecules of the wine, interact together to form the different aroma nuances and to explain the quality that we perceive. So today we can understand all these interactions uh, till the point in which we can uh, present it like a game. And as all the games, we can present different elements. So the basic elements of the game are, of course, the game feel, that will be what we call the aroma buffer that we will explain to you. Uh, secondly, the players, of course, the odorants, and the roles and rules of the game. So, uh, this, what I'm going to present you is the result of many years of research. So what we have done, it always begins with the wine. We have taken an extract of the wine. We have used uh, gas chromatography or factometry and different screening techniques to uh, identify the mm, most important odorants. We have invested many hours of time to identify further to make quantitative methods for quantifying them. And we finally have spent a very funny period of time just mixing chemicals, doing a kind of perfumistic game, so that we finally understand or think we understand the, the aroma of wine. So in that's as you see, a, 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 a part of aroma deconstruction, but of course uh, another very important part of aroma reconstruction. So what we have learned in, in just a very few words is the first thing, the first idea is that ethanol and the major volatiles of fermentation form what we kind an aroma buffer that is very difficult to break, so that it is not easy that an aroma molecule can be perceived in that context. In fact, some, only some aroma molecules or some groups of aroma molecules acting together can break effectively the, the buffer so that they really can transmit to the wine their particular aroma nuances and then we will perceive something different. Uh, Another very important point is that there are many molecules that even if you can't perceive them clearly in the wain, they are just um, distorting the aroma quality of the wine and making the, the intensity of the positive aroma nuances to decrease. These molecules should be considered as defects even if we don't know them yet as, as that. And of course, that what we will see as well is that the most interesting and complex wines are those in which there are several aromatic vectors interacting together. Uh, well, by simple addition, by competition, by hybridization to form a new aroma nuance, but always having that will explain the complexity. So let's go to the first part of this game. So this is the play field, the, the, the aroma buffer. So the base of wine aroma is formed by 27 chemical substances that are present in all the wines and naturally fermented beverages are all of them at concentrations well above threshold and they produce a typical vinous, uh, just sometimes just a plain or null aroma, in which most often the individual aroma nuances cannot be perceived. And they form what they, we call an aroma buffer. And what's an aroma buffer? I will explain uh, in this way. If we put some a strong uh, aroma smelling molecules in water and we just smell that uh, solution, then what happens, of course, is that the molecules reach our olfactory receptors. There is a, a, a reaction in, in the brain and that finally ends with the sensory perception in, that, in this case of a strawberry. 
So, but if we put exactly the same aroma molecules in wine, uh, then these molecules will be, of course, together with ethanol and the other wine major volatiles, and they will reach, of course, again, our receptors together with ethanol, and will happen most of the time is that the sensory perception will have been absolutely destroyed. So, in fact, there is, I mean, there is controversy, and surely there is a question of both interactions at the receptor levels and, of course, yes, also cognitive interactions. But we are not going to discuss that. That's a fact. That's something that really happens. Um, the buffering effect of the, of the base is, we call buffering just add, as a resemblance to the chemical buffers. The chemical buffers that we use to fix the pH of a solution and that make possible that that solution uh, has a, a stable pH, the same whether you add some acid or whether you add some alkali, the pH remains sta stable. Exactly the same happens to this buffer. You can add some aroma molecules and nothing will change, and you can take out some aroma molecules and nothing will change again. So uh, I am going to, to show some very old results that we have nearly 10 years ago about this, and we have uh, that mixture, and we began removing just one per one uh, the different aroma molecules. And all these molecules were clearly above the thresholds. And so, in these cases, we couldn't see any sensory effect. So that was really a buffer. And in these other cases, uh, we in fact could be able to see some sensory effect. But the funny thing is that in most cases, the sensory effect was so tiny that the the, the, the judges were not really able to tell us what has changed. Only in two cases, the two that are marked in red, isomyl acetate and beta damascenone, there was really a clear, and uh, not very soon, but clear uh, change. In the case of this molecule, that other one seemed to be effectively contributing to the fruity aroma because the fruity aroma decreased when it was removed. And this other molecule, beta damascenone, when was removed from the mixture, there was a clear decrease in the general intensity of the mixture. So that, that aroma seemed to play a role of an aroma enhancer. And still more shocking was when to that particular buffer, we have different molecules at concentration sometimes huge. And again, the effect of adding huge amounts of molecules was, was nothing. So in most cases, you see that the effect even was not noticeable or was very slight. And what is also very important is that in most cases, you see, for instance, you, you add furaniol in this case, and furaniol smells um, caramel, but you didn't perceive in that particular case caramel. What you perceived was less banana. And that, that, that was pretty general. And again, only in one case, there was a connection between the sensory chains and the sensory properties of the other one. And that was, again, in the case of high acetate. So we really can conclude that only in this case, in this particular buffer, that cannot be generalized, uh, in this particular buffer, acetate has been the single molecule able to break the buffer and to communicate to the mixture the banana, the typical aroma, uh, banana aroma. Are all buffers equally as strong? No, of course. That's a very important thing. In general, the higher level of alcohols, the more aggressive the buffer will be, and breaking it will be far more difficult. And hence, whenever you have a strong and aggressive buffer derived from a given condition of fermentations, that wine will really find difficulties to communicate or to express the aromas the aroma molecules that they have inside. And the fact is that still today we don't understand very well all this game. So mm, the, the role of the other major wine volatiles, such as fatty acids, for instance, we, we don't understand them very well. We are just uh, uh, researching uh, this at this moment. 
Okay, but, you know, fortunately, not all the wines smell vinos, smell something else, and very attractive, so what means that, in fact, there are molecules that are uh, successful at breaking the buffer. By observation, we have observed that the buffer sometimes is broken by a single odorant molecule at concentration large enough. Mm, some other times is a group of homologous molecules uh, acting together, or sometimes it's a combination of many groups of different molecules uh, acting together and showing some aromatic descriptor. So in the first case, we refer to an impact odorant. In the second one, we refer to an impact family. And in the third case, we refer to subtle or just minor uh, aroma compounds or aroma families. So to explain this, let me just uh, introduce you what we call the psychophysical plots so, or functions. So this is just a relationship between the intensity of the, in this case, isomyl acetate and the concentration. So, um, and we can divide this plot into four different uh, areas. And of course, when isomyl acetate is at present at very low amounts, it just is barely perceived. And in wines, it, it, when, when, when a wine contains this molecule at this uh, concentration, this molecule will just contribute with many others to the general fruit or sweet fruit aroma of the wine. However, if, if, the, if the, this molecule is present at higher concentrations, then it will be a more important contributor, not a still a major contributor, but a more a neat contributor. Here, there is a transition area in which some of you will be able to perceive clearly the banana note, some others not yet, and will perceive just a fruity note. And finally, at high concentrations, this molecule will impact uh, in, in all the cases our brain and will detect clearly its banana, banana uh, characteristic. So, but if we look at the range in which this molecule can be find, uh, found in wine, you will see that really in wine, uh, you, you can find this molecule at all these concentration levels. So that, that means that in, in wine, this com in some wines, this compound will be just a subtle compound. In some others will be a neat contributor. In some others will be a major contributor. And in some others will be an impact odorant or even maybe a defect if we really didn't want to have a banana smell there. So on the contrary, uh, here there is a second molecule, uh, strawberry smelling. We can do exactly the same considerations. and. What happens here is you see that the natural range of this compound in wine is very, very far from the area in which this compound can be really act as impact compound. So that means that in wine, this compound on, by itself only can be just a subtle or minor aroma compound or perhaps a neat contributor in some wines. So this possibility makes us possible to uh, classify the aroma components, the odorants of the wine, attending to the, uh, the role that they can play in some of the wines of the world. So first, the impact compounds or families that are all those compounds or families of compounds that can definitely transmit their specific or characteristic aroma to the wine. Second one, the major contributors that are those compounds that are um, transmitting not their specific aroma note, but a generic part of its aroma note. And what happens is that if we remove these compounds out of the wine, what we'll notice will be a strong decrease in the intensity of that aroma, and perhaps even a slight change on quality. So then we have neat contributors that are compounds that are always acting together with some other compounds and just contribute to a general note such as floral or such as fruity. Um, the omission will cause just a slight decrease in the intensity of the aroma note, but by any means uh, we will observe a change in the quality of wine. 
and of course, just minor contributors that will be compounds that uh, they, in fact, contribute all together with many other compounds sharing some aroma properties to a particular aroma nuance, but the contribution is so weak that if you only remove one of them, you surely will not notice any change on the aroma. So um, which ones are the impact compounds? So three compounds derived from the grape, uh, linalol, fibrous oxide, beta damascenone. Again, mercap, three mercaptans also derived from the grape. Um, isomil acetate, of course, whiskey lactone, diacetyl, sotolone, methionyl, and phenethesaldehyde that play quite an ambiguous role. Dimethyl sulfide that as well can play an ambiguous role. Fulfuil thiol and benzene mercaptan, and of course, rotundone. So what? So this, the important thing is that these 16 compounds are, we can say, um, the, for, for a pinter, would be the 16 primary colors to pint wines, if you understand me, okay? So, and what this means is that in, as these are potential impact compounds that in some part of the world, you will find a very good wine in which you can directly recognize the smell of these wines. Uh, so we don't have much time, so, but of course, uh, you can recognize linalol in muscat, t rosoxine, heustramina, etc., etc., etc. Okay, another important concept is that of aroma families. And don't forget that wine is a very complex beverage. And so that means that um, there are several compounds that are produced along the same biochemical route in grape or during fermentation, and that very often those compounds share aromatic properties. So that means that these groups of compounds are going to act collectively uh, to produce a concerted action on a, an aroma node. The example, for instance, the ethyl esters of branched fatty acids. So in wine we do have uh, at least five or six different esters, all of them smelling strawberry. Ethyl 2 methyl butyrate, ethyl isobutyrate, ethyl isovirate, ethyl 2, 3, and 4 methyl pentanoides. So if we come back to the pore aroma molecule, ethyl 2 methyl butyrate, and we conclude that this molecule never could be a major contributor to wine, but if, however, we take into consideration that this aroma compound is going to act concertedly with the other ethyl esters of branched acids, then the differences begin, become obvious because the natural range expands so that, okay, so this should happen, okay, so that, that in fact it can reach the transition and it can be very near the impact area so that this family can really be important in the perception of strawberries in, in, in wine. Okay, so there are many other important families, vanillins, uh, burn sugars, compounds, volatile phenols, I'm not going to, to mention all of them. What I want just to remark here is that families add 10 more aroma nuances, 10 more primary colors to play with to form the different wine aroma nuances. Following concept, aroma enhancers. Aroma enhancers, uh, they are compounds that counteract the effect of the buffering effect of the base so that when you add the aroma enhancer, you have the possibility of perceiving something that you were not able to perceive before. And it is uh, funny that sometimes these compounds uh, change a bit the perception so that sometimes the, 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 the perception is, is a different, uh, what you perceive is a different order. And, and at least there are three molecules that we have identified that can play this role. These are furanol, the are beta damascenone, and dimethyl sulfide. So an example of uh, fruity aroma enhancers 
If you take 13 fruity esters that are, you will find in all the red wines, if you put this mixture in water, you will is have a beautiful and intense apple odor. But if you put this mixture in a hydroalcoholic media, then you will just perceive uh, something sweet. Even you will perceive some of you can perceive as a, absolutely nothing. And if you are directly to wine, most surely you won't you won't perceive any change. So then here comes the enhancers. We just add a bit of bitter amastenone and bitter ionone, and then suddenly in water ethanol, the it appears a very fruit note. This is not a strawberry, it's not apple, but it is, it is uh, a very interesting odor. But uh, still in wine, this, in this particular wine, it wasn't enough. So if then we add more of the enhancer. So the funny thing is that in the hydroalcoholic solution, then we, we, we perceive clearly plum and raisin that, in fact, is the smell of bitter damastenone. So in, in, in this sense, apparently, was the 13 esters that were enhancing bitter damastenone. But still, in wine, there was no change. And then, and then, it was just a bit of dimethyl sulfide, and suddenly everything changed, and a strong berry fruit and cherry aroma came out of the wine. So that's really how the aroma enhancers work. And finally, I also, I'm not going to finish, eh? <laughs> not yet. I have half an hour, no? Okay, thank you. Five hours. <laughs> so, but I, the following idea is about defects. So when an aroma becomes a defect, so the obvious, or one of the obvious answer is when it is not expected in the product. But I should recall your attention that this is a very relative definition that will depend on our expend, uh, experience and on what we expect. And of course, the, the, the world of enology is full of very bad wines having strong defects that the local consumers have been got used to and they think that they are fantastic. And so I don't think this is really a very good definition. And in addition, this definition is only useful whenever you really can perceive the smell. But my point is that we should consider a defect or those molecules that whenever they are removed out of the wine, then the positive characteristics of that wine improve. Uh, so this this definition is a pragmatic definition, but has two major advantages. First, it uh, limits somehow the relativity, and secondly, makes it possible to consider as defects those molecules that are not really being perceived, but that are impairing, that are just decreasing the quality of the wine, and that's what more often happens. So again, I can't use uh, this example to, to explain this idea. This is 4 phenol. you all know it very well. We can define again the same areas, and you know the different uh, smells that we will perceive whenever there is ethyl phenol in wines. That depends, of course, in the wine. But let me recall your attention that most of the time, only in this area, we consider that this compound is a problem. But the truth is that in these areas, even if you are not at all perceiving foreign phenol, it is removing a large part of the positive aroma characteristics of the wine. I'm going to show you this in a very little example. So here there are some wines, artificial wines that we made um, with different intensity of fruity notes. And we add just different levels of 40 phenol to these wines. So in the first case, it was very easy to change the aroma. In the second case, it was a little bit not that easy. And in the third case, it still was more complicated. But of course, in all cases, the judges agreed that at 700 parts per billion, uh, that wine was strongly phenolic. Yeah, but however, please take note 
that in all the cases, just 50 parts per billion of 4 ethyl phenol made the wine to be significantly perceived as less fruity. So this has a really important effect on the wine quality. So according to this, again, we can make a very big list of compounds that can work as defects. Okay. Uh, the question of how these quality depreciators relate to quality is that we have been for many years trying to relate quality with composition, and in all the cases, we always have found this general equation. Always the quality is somehow the, 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 the addition of all the positive contributors that wine has. And you have to discount, to subtract all the negative contributors. So this seems to be a general truth. And of course, take into consideration that it is not really necessary that the negative contributors are above threshold. And of course, it is not required that the wine, in fact, is smell or perceived as with an off flavor. So this fact repeatedly verified demonstra demonstrated the essential importance of quality depreciators on perception of positive aroma nuances. And to finish, I will show you an example of uh, one quality we just did, uh, we took 25 Spanish premium red wines. Um, the quality we was assessed by 21 experts and there was a pretty good uh, coincidence of that. We ran also a complete gas chromatography olfactometric method to quantify, to semi-quantify all the odorants. And we classified the odorants into four categories, and we were just putting together the intensity uh, or uh, scores of the different odorants in each category. So the first category was fruity compounds. We found 13 compounds with fruity characteristics in those wines. No, no 13, no, 15. Uh, a second character, uh, group was we put together all the compounds that are usually considered defects even if they were not perceived as such in the wines, such as TCA, uh, the dimethyl methoxyparacins, or 4 ethylphenol. A third category was compounds that don't smell very well, even if they don't, are usually not really considered as defects. And the, all the other odorants that in this case were not really relevant. Okay, so just putting all this information together, we just came across a fantastic model for predicting wine quality. So the, the quality of these red wines was perfectly explained by this simple equation. The quality is just the addition of all the fruity compounds that the wine has, minus all the negative compounds that the wine has and the defective compounds that the wine has. So, and, and the, the, the ability to predict the quality of the wine with these scores was fantastic. So, in summary, uh, as you see, there are 27 aroma compounds that form the base of wine aroma, exerting what we call the aroma buffer. And the strength of that buffer is determined by the relative levels of these compounds. There are 47 aroma compounds with 26 different aromatic nuances that are the main responsible for sensory differences between wine types and varieties, 16 potential impact compounds, and 31 in families with 10 different odorants. There are three compounds that can act as aroma enhancers, and there are more than 30 compounds that can ruin quality. Okay. Um, I, and in fact, I have many more things to, to tell to you, but uh, it's, I think that we don't have really time for that, don't we? So uh, can we move to the, 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 the last, no, the previous one to the last? The last, no, 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 to the last one of the presentation.
That's just in case. More, 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 more. Okay. Okay. So, then, just, <laughs> what, of course, just let me just acknowledge all the people that were uh, in the lab with us. There are 17 people working and many more that have been worked for many years for completing this piece of, of work. Of course, our major sponsors that here has been, of course, the European Union and the Spanish ministries and the Diputación General de Aragón. Um, my final message, in, in fact, please keep in mind that wine aroma must be understood uh, like, like, like an orchestra. Okay, so the quality is given by harmony, and it is very easy and it's problematic to discover who uh, who who is out of tune, and the complexity of the sound with increase with the complexity of the orchestra, and of course, the higher the complexity, the smaller the role of the individual aroma compounds. And now I think that is all. Thank you very much for your attention.